I will tell you something about cyclic loading on weblogs. Um, uh, first, I will start with the background of, yeah, Tom mentioned it, it was my bachelor's thesis. Then I will give you some basics, uh, some more theoretical stuff. And I will continue with the justification of the loading condition, which means uh, what we tested. Then come, come the tests itself and the results. And, and then I give you a short input about manual and numerical analysis, which I did for my thesis. And But I don't want to talk much about it, just give you some um, answers to just the summary and finish with conclusion and recommendations. So um, the background, as said, my bachelor's thesis at the University of Lucerne, I did uh, their um, bachelor as a civil engineer. It was an unusual bachelor's thesis. <laughs> I did it as a, with a partnership with the ISA Safety Commission, which I'm now a new part of. And then uh, there were some pre previous tests at the University of Nottingham, which came um, with uh, from the ISA Safety Commission and were just um, made, uh, uh, they were just um, made at the University at Nottingham, this, this was no bachelor's thesis or something like this. So um, basic forces in slack lines, slack lines in general, this is a diagram from Flo, I think we saw one of this kind before. Um, you see a uh, pretension on, in a slack line of nearly around three uh, kilonewtons on the left. And then there was someone going on the line, which increases uh, the force in the line up to five kilonewtons. And then the numbers two, three, and four are some jumps on the line. You see it's a short line, three, uh, 13 meters polyester, uh, 35 millimeters wide. So it's uh, like uh, these are big forces in a short, um, not very stretchy long line but it's what is possible in a line which can, could be rigged like this every day. So we have this maximum range of forces, which is between two and seven kilonewtons. Yes, um, then uh, this is a theoretical um, background about the impact of cyclic loads in the material. That's the first important thing. These um, X, Y uh, um, curves are just for the material itself. You see the curve, the, the blue one on the, the lowest is from aluminium and the other two are from steel. And this is the fatigue curve, also called a uh, welder curve. And what you see here is on the X axis, the horizontal axis is the number of cycles which were made. One cycle is if you uh, make the tension to two kilonewton and then go back to zero and two zero like this, and once up onto two to zero and back is, is one cycle. So on the Y axis and um, vertical, you have the maximum stress amplitude, which means um, how much um, you, how much of the strength the material have. So um, what's to say? If you have like 100 cycles, you're up to the maximum strength of the material. And if you have like uh, one or two million <laughs> cycles, you come into a, a re range where the, the strength doesn't get lower. Uh, so it's continuously like um, there. An important thing is this, um, this graph, uh, the X and Y axis are logarithmic. So if you have like, the, the, um, the impact of the strength from 100 to 1,000 cycles, which means 900 cycles, make, um, get, make the same, have the same impact to the strength as it is from um, 100,000 to 1 million. So the more cycles you have, the less is the impact of the cyclic loads. That's an important thing. And also um, to see, you have like here um, at the steel, you have an increase maximum of 60% of the strength of the material. And in aluminium, you have 70%. So aluminium is a little bit weaker, but still um, it's like, yes, a little bit the same things. So this water curve is for the material and it's like the basic behind the impact of cyclic loads to the material itself. Another thing, um, this amplitude is just like 
always measured. These curves are always made from um, uh, if you have the tension, you you tension it to two kilonewton, and then you have the pressure of two kilonewton, and this is the cycle you make. So these curves are always or mostly made with the same tension as as um, as you have, like um, yeah, you tension it, and then you you have the pressure. Always tension pressure. This load and on the web, on the webbing and on the web blocks, we always are in the tension. So at the left side, we have the Smith diagram, which shows us the difference. So you have this weather curve, who is there in the in the dark durable range, and then on the left side, you have like there the blue spot is what the weather curve says. You have like going up the y-axis the same to the RE as you go to the down to the minus RE, which shows us the stress in the positive range is like um, tension and then on the minus it's the pressure. So if, you, if we only have tension, we are maybe someone around there on the red line and you always have the tension and you see um, from this uh, axis, which is 45 degrees, there you go the same up and down and the half of this red line is is the the amplitude so which the smith, what the smith diagram shows us is that if we only have tension um the maximum amplitude a material can get is a little bit smaller than it is at the world diagram if you have the same tension and pressure but it's not pretty much but that's the, what the material makes in theory. So if we want to have these curves for web blocks, we have to do like thousands of tests and then put all these uh, stress amplitudes and have these points where we can make at least one uh, in last one of these curves, but that's impossible. That's too much. That's too expensive. So that's what's behind the theoretical basis. So um, what we tested is um, Load, two load cases. We had the load case standard with the forces from two to seven kilonewtons, which were, as I said with the diagram before, which are with a normal setup, like maximum range. You also see down there's the world curve uh, again, and you see the important thing is the amplitude, which, may, which means the gap between the maximum and the minimum force. It's not, if you have, from two to seven kilonewtons and you have from seven to 12 kilonewton, it's not, it's not the same, but it's like similar. But if you have from two to eight kilonewton and from two to seven, that's the bigger difference. So the, the gap between the maximum forces is the important thing. So from two to seven kilonewton is possible. The frequency is important for the during of the tests because the load cycles, you see, we have 100,000 cycles, which we tested. Um, with this frequency of two hertz, we have like a one duration of 14 hours machine time, which is pretty expensive. Um, and then you see down there, these points on the curves is like on 100,000 cycles, how much we and um, the impact of the, in the material should be, just the material itself. So if we want to make them weaken the material more, as I said before, we had to do 900,000 cycles more to have this same impact as we have from 100 to 1,000 cycles. So you have to look there um, what's the most intelligent to test. Yes, and the, the load case max we, we tested was just the maximum range which was possible on this machine we had in the, at the University of Lucerne, which was 1 to 8 kilonewton, which was the, the, the widest gap possible. And the one hertz was because the machine couldn't do it uh, as fast as with the two hertz. Um, a bounce or a leash fall has usually a frequency from one hertz or uh, 0.5 hertz. But um, from one to two hertz, the, this difference isn't relevant for, for, the, um, for the strength of the web block. So uh, the, the more interesting thing is the tests and the results. I tested uh, the Slackinov Slacky block version 2020. You see red on the top. 
And then I tested the Mithril and the Rowan uh, 1.3, I think, yes, without bending side plates. I wanted to test like some weblogs I think are, we thought are uh, weaker because we wanted to have results with this. There are some weblogs which uh, most, uh, yeah, most likely don't show any results because they are too stable. That's a good thing. So we tested this. At the University of Nottingham, the previous tests, they tested the old version of the Slacken of Slacky block, which uh, was the only web block which failed under the tests. And it was, they thought it was because of uh, not heat treating the side plates after um, bending them. So they made with the new version, they, they heat treated it. And I wanted to test if this was the, the fault. And so um, you see also how the test uh, setups are. You see at the right side, the static test setup where we broke the new, one new sample each to have like a breaking strength. And then uh, the static test setup is shown down under. Um, and there you, you see the, the left, the test itself has like, psych the cyclic test has 14 hours, that's much, that's expensive. And the static test is just like, the, the, yeah, put tension on it and then it breaks and finish it is. But it's not that easy because just to make the setup, I had to, to build this gray thing here because each machine is different. And we, we had to make a setup which just, um, make the forces there where it in reality will be on the web block and don't uh, put, yeah, to, to have them on the right place and just to, to have a, a program, how do I want to test, which results do I want to have? The test itself doesn't cost much of time, but the whole thing is very, uh, has very many um, things you have to look at. So um, the results were, as you see um, here at the Mithril and the Rowan, you see how they they broke. The Mithril broke under cyclic after cyclic loads and with the static tests, same the same um, failure mechanism. It bent the front pin first, and then before it could collapse, there was this screw of the center diverter, which uh, from the shear forces which um, failed. So this was the failure mechanism after cyclic loads and without cyclic loads. So there was no difference. It, um, the cyclic loads had not an important, a relevant impact of the mithril. And by the Roman, it was the same thing. You see there, the construction isn't perfect because the failure mechanism is because of um, the, the lack of, of material here, what they cut off. Um, but there was also no difference between the failure mechanisms after the cyclic loads and before without cyclic loads. Um, other at the slack, slacky block, this on the top, the picture is uh, on the static test. There it broke on the, in the side plates uh, next to the central diverter. It collapsed there. And then under, cy under cyclic loads or after cyclic loads, it um, broke at the bended side plates where they had uh, failed before at Nottingham. Um, to see more numbers, you, sh you have their um, slacky block. At the static test, the breaking strength was 50 kilonewtons, which means five tons. At the cyclic test from two to seven kilonewtons with the forces which can, um, appear, uh, which are realistic in the, in the normal use of a slack line. We had a re reduction of the breaking strength to three tons. And then if, as we tested it from one to eight kilonewton, it failed, as you see in the picture below, at 88,000 cycles. These 88,000 cycles can appear, uh, are realistic in, in, a, in a intensive use of a slack line of a web block. So uh, the Mithril and the Rowan, they haven't shown any difference in the numbers of the breaking strength. So we can say, okay, there's no weakening of under these 100,000 cycles, cycles and this range of, of force. But uh, what we saw is there on the bended side plates, and they were no, not stable, so, uh, stabilized. So these side plates always bended a little bit on each cycle, and this bending, this this um, 
this movement weakened the material because the failure on the cyclic loads is because of micro cracks in the material which are getting bigger and bigger from each cycle and is this is also logarithmic so in at the start the the, the grown of the of the crack is not pretty fast but and in the end it goes up and bam there off we go so um this was the case because of the bending of the side plates they failed and the material is okay but the, the geometric geometrical design is not uh, perfect and um to have a failure on this range is like okay maybe it's not appearing on the daily use but also to have nothing here at the other web blocks also in nothing and the other web blocks tested haven't shown any difference in the, um, the failure mechanism um, but the slacky block shown a failure so we can say there is uh, uh, something weaker than the other web blocks um, what I did for my bachelor thesis was I tried to make a manual and numerical analysis which means I made a lot of calculations um, by hand and with a program. Here by hand, I, I made the analysis on the weak, uh, possibly weak um, points or, um, yes, uh, points on the web block. Um, and I, I looked at the, the, um, the stress at these points and looked at the Wohler curve or the fatigue curve where I am and if, if I have a failure after these cycles. And um, what I can say is that it's not possible or I couldn't do it with a manual analysis because there are so many, so many things I had to look at because they, as you see on the bottom, uh, the green line is what, what the force wants to do with the slacky block. It's a uh, look from the top, you see the central diverter, front pin and back rear attachment so um if i if i um have put it under tension the side plates will bend a little bit and then the the flow of the force will will be different and all these small like plastic deformations you also have under higher loads under higher tensions forces so um all these impacts i can't really put it in a manual analysis so it's not with with one bachelor thesis, it's not possible to make a functional manual analysis. I also did like with a finite element method uh, with a program. I created the model of of the web blocks, and I tried to to make an analysis there. But uh, with the program I used, which was which was Rhino, and um, um, yeah, ask me if you want to know about it. I forgot the name. Uh, with this program, I I tried to make this model and make it and um, put it under tension here on the on the webbing. But what I had uh, problems with was the, the contact here because the pins with the side plates and how the central diverter is with the side plates and how the webbing the contact of the webbing to the central diverter and all these things were too complicated and I had some. The, pro the, more, um, the program couldn't uh, define, define these contacts um, like it was in reality. So I couldn't get um, like real, uh, a, a real behavior of the model. So if, with another program, it could be possible, but also there to, to the licenses of these programs are pr very, very expensive. Uh, and it's not possible for the ISA or for, yeah, for us to, to, to buy this, to have this uh, money. So it's also not really possible to make a uh, numerical analysis. So um, to make a conclusion, um, I start with the last part now. Um, <laughs> to know more about the behavior of the web blocks under cyclic loads, which we saw at the slacky block, there is an impact of the cyclic loads on the web blocks. But, and we need to know more about this because it can break the, the old like a book broke from the tests uh, from the range to two to seven kilonewtons, which you all can uh, this force you all can have in your slack line. So we need to know if, if the, this is the only web block or are there other geometrical or material things 
we can make wrong and which have a, a big impact on the cycle load. And to know more about this, we had to do further tests to, to can analyze it better because the, the other analyses are pretty uh, too complex. It's just too complex to make it with a, yes, to calculate it manually or to have these programs. And uh, the, the cyclic loads have the relevant influence we saw at the Slack block. And what we can say now, because of the test we did, is the bended side plates with the free movement are very vulnerable to cyclic loads and be careful with that. Um, yes, that's all we know now. Um, if you have some questions about the num numerical and the, 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 the analysis, you can ask me. I won't talk more about this, but I spend a lot, a lot of time with that. So if somebody wants to do something like that, talk to me. <laughs> you can um, save time because of my failures. Um, yes, um, if you have questions, please ask me now. I'm done with my presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jan. Very interesting presentation. Um, I'm sure lots of people have questions. Some were already asked in the chat section. Maybe, Jan, you can open the chat section. And um, a couple questions in there already. Maybe we can go through these first. Okay, chat section. Is it what is maximum stress amplitude and how is it measured? Um, Peter asked the first question, what is the maximum stress amplitude? Okay, um, the maximum stress amplitude. The, if you, if you ha have the tension in your weblog from two to seven kilonewtons, if you make a bounce, your pre-tension is two kilonewton maximum force at the lowest point of the bounce is seven kilonewtons, then your, your force makes like this curve from, up from two kilonewtons up to seven down and then you have a middle. Then from seven to two kilonewtons, the stress is like the force per um, square millimeter on the material. It's just like pressure. Um, and then that stress, so the amplitude is like half of this range between two and seven kilonewtons. So that's, that's the amplitude. And you can measure it um, if you have the force and you have the area of your material. So you make the force um, divided through the area. So that's, um, that's it. And, and what, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, but like how, what, what does it measure and how, why does it change so much? And what, the, I mean, you have the, like you change in, uh, in your amplitude, that's what your machine gives, I thought. And then does, it, uh, does only the area change then, or how, how does the stress change? I, don't, I just don't understand what this is measuring. Uh, I mean, it's supposed to measure something on the, on the material, but uh, maybe I can ask later as well if, you, if it's too complicated. Uh, do you mean that the fatigue curve, or what, uh, where is, or for the tests? And the curve that was uh, lowering the the stress on yes. the cycles, and I don't understand uh, what it measures, uh, what what it actually like. I would have thought you would try to measure how strong it is after so and so many cycles, but then you would have to break it, and I guess that's not what you did. So I'm, I just don't know what you measured there after so and so many cycles. Yes, yes. Um, the, what I showed, the, theo the theory, the, the weather diagram or the fatigue diagram is a material, um, is what the material makes. They, they made a lot of tests to, to say, okay, the aluminium, this and that uh, composition has like this behavior. And then they, they have like this, this, this uh, curve it gives. But um, what we do is just, that's the theory behind we are under this, we, if it breaks at this point, yes, that's right. But we are under this line and we don't know where exactly we are. But we, this was just to show that how, what, what, uh, what happens with the material if we have more cycles. So the more cycles you have, the weaker it gets because if you just 
tension and material and then it breaks at some stress at, the, at its maximum stress so if you make like not this maximum stress but more cycles it would also break under its maximum stress that's so maximum stress is what uh, uh, when it would break that's the the, the amount yes of Oh, so so this is uh, these these diagrams were general diagrams for for the material aluminium and hasn't had, didn't have anything to do with your tests and specific. Yes, yes, yes. That's the theory behind the material, just to understand what's the behavior of uh, cyclic loads. Yes, okay. Yes. Um, Peter, maybe to explain the the test setup again. So because of machine time, we test all our web locks um, to a maximum of hundred thousand cycles. And then if they get destroyed before that, we have that number of cycles. Most of them survive 100,000 and then we just break test them, right? Because that's our solution. We cannot test for a million cycles. That's like the general test setup. So everybody also on the third tips again. Thank you, Thomas. So, and then thank you, Jan, for that talk, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, rats like lines, thank you for the respect. <laughs> To find an element gives different results. And um, Navin asked me to do finite element programs give different results for cyclic testing versus a single pulse test, for example. There is there are some uh, finite element programs where, where you can make where you can simulate these cycles. But as said, these are very expensive programs. And uh, on the program I did, I didn't get this far because <laughs> my contacts weren't fine. So I saw, okay, um, the force, how it flows into the weblock is not right. So I didn't go this far. But with ANSYS, this is one of the programs. I know you can do this. If you have to write um, material, um, you, you must define def Define, yeah, yeah, you have to define the material, um, how it behaves, and then if you if you put every uh, input in right, then you can yes, you can really uh, look at the results under cyclic loads. But that's much of an effort to go there. And then another, which um, other which other web blocks were tested? with bent side plates design so um at nottingham they tested the links for us right and he has bended side plates but he has this connection in the back so the movement is uh, they it the percent bended side plates cannot move and uh, as you see on the isa website the results of the tests in nottingham um i think there was there was a weakening of the links under a Big, um, big, big um, tension. Actually, we tested the, the double pin version, not the ah, okay. Sides. Yeah, so I think the slacky block is the only one we have so far tested um, under cyclic loading with bent side plates, as far as I know, right? So, uh, hi, Thomas. Hi, Jan. Uh, I, the, only, the only reason I ask is uh, my understanding of the of your thesis and the report which you prepared was that none of the web blocks except slacky block was compromised by a high number of cyclic loads, right? So that's why I was curious to know our learning is, okay, it is slacky block, it is one brand, one web block, but maybe we can draw some uh, parallel learnings, say banana, for example, by slack house, right? It has a bent... Uh, plate and I don't think in uh, in the design part of it, I don't think it's very different from Slacky Block. I don't know if Slacky Block is stainless steel 304, but I know that Banana is SS 304. So uh, I, I was just curious to know whether we can learn or draw any parallels because that is the conclusion of your study, right? So where can we uh, ex extrapolate data to apply to other brands or other products? Something yes, that's uh, what we hope to um, have from more tests we we wanted to do to to look at it what the what the behavior is um yeah we can't say it definitely because but 
um, as I did the analysis and as I looked at the theory behind the cyclic loads, I saw that you, you knew it all with these uh, small things to, to put papers together. You can bend it four times and then it's broken. So it's not, if you and tension it with the same force, it would make nothing. So, you know, the bending is what weakens the material. And I saw actually with my eyes that the side plates bend it. And I looked at uh, how the forces went into the web locks and the only, exp uh, a nice explanation is, okay, you it's bending there. And 100,000 bends make something and, and let these micro cracks grow. And you have other tests where they say, okay, movement is not good. So it's what I said it should be. But to prove it, you are right. We have to do further tests and look, this was aluminum, the slacky block. And aluminum has a, yeah, 70 percent maximum redundancy uh, reduce. And on steel, we have to look, okay, if it's similar, maybe we find out. The problem is to have the money and the, the, the machine time somewhere to, te to make this test, actually. <laughs> Which is why I was asking about the software, because, okay, I understand it might be expensive to get the software, but uh, I would just imagine logistically it being so much easier if we had one genius who knew how to use the software and one license. I can yes, imagine yes. ISA's, ISA's work becoming so much easier <laughs> without having to actually do a lot of the actual... Yeah, for, that, uh, for this, I have uh, like uh, my prof said um, they have he worked in Germany as a, in an international um, uh, enterprise which make facade and, and they make like in Dubai or something these big uh, skyscrapers and they also have this software but they they, they prepare every uh, model onto the detail and then they take the, the license for two weeks and they just let it calculate because it's so expensive. Even an international enterprise makes it like this. So imagine what the ISA can do. <laughs> yes. And um, Peter asked, do, do you have an idea how big stress samples it will be on a, on a web block? Okay, um, this question, this question, Peter, you ask um, of the, how big the stress amplitude would be on a one to eight kilonewton loading on a web block. So um, the stress is, as I said, per square millimeter. So um, maybe I go back to some point of the presentation. Uh, if you look at there, the, the side um, view of the slacky block, the stress um, in the web block, so here behind it's easy because... Sorry, somebody... Are you trying to share something right now? Because Aha, I, I stopped sharing. Okay. I want to start. So I mean uh, the, the stress is the amplitude of the of the kilonewtons divided by the area. And I mean the the amplitude yes. of the kilonewtons is eight minus one divided by two, so that's three point five kilonewtons, but then the question is what is the area, right? Okay, yes, and that depends of where in the web block you want to measure. That's it, okay? You have the small areas here, but which force is here in this part of the web block? So if we have, like, on the on the line, we have 7 kilonewtons of, newtons of tension, and then we know uh, here on the rear attachment there are also somewhere 10 kilonewtons. So we have suspended side plates. We have, like, two side plates. We have two strength uh, parts here. So it's the force divided through four, which is here in one part. And we have this area, so we have the stress there. So we make the same thing with two kilonewtons. We have another stress. So we have these two extreme stresses. We make uh, the gap between divided to two per two, and then we have like the amplitude. So, so but do you, know, do you have a guess on the area? Or do you have a guess on the uh, on the stress that you put on? Because uh, yeah, I, if you have that guess, then you could put it into your into your diagram and see and guess how many cycles it should. Uh, I made I made exactly this for my manual analysis, and so uh, with with this um, with what I do, it was always okay. There is no impact of cyclic loads uh, to my web block. But then the slacky 
block failed. So I saw that my manual analysis wasn't good enough because the way the, the world diagram is just um is one uh, material what the material does but the web block is not just a material it's like an object with with the bending of the side plates has an impact of this, the, the weakening of the material then the, how the force went through the movement and the plastic deformation all these are impacts which uh, are things which have an impact to the to the maximum resistance of, of the web block itself. The world diagram is just for the raw material. Imagine you have like a, a quarter of aluminium and then you, you, you put this under tension or under cyclic loads. Then the world diagram would show these results. Mm -hmm. But the web block is like too complicated. And did you compare the results? Of, like, I mean, imagine it would be raw material just uh, pulled like that or whatever, then I guess the it's just the thin plate, it's just the cross section, right? That's gonna be the area. Uh, did yes. you compare the, those calculations to the actual results in the end? Like just to see how far off is it by all these external factors that are different? Yeah, and the thing is, to, I at the tests with the results, I can not say how big the stress was in the material because the stress you can't measure with something you can you had to to go uh, through the through the strain of the material and then you have like uh, but this is this is just it's pretty small you can't measure that it's it's just too complicated to have like the stress on the several points in the web block that's not really uh, yeah that's that doesn't function like this thanks for trying to answer it Thanks a lot, everyone, uh, for this great for this great presentation and also for questions and answers. Weren't there a couple of questions before me that wasn't weren't answered? I think he went through all of them, as far as I know. Oh. Okay, I missed some. Uh, there, there, was, there was a couple of questions there. I mean, I, if we haven't got time for them, it's all good. But I see, I see. I saw it in yours, Chris. Shall we spend and another five to ten minutes on questions and answers? Are you yeah, if, if you're running out of time and you don't don't have the time, you feel free to skip over mine. It's okay. Let's take another five minutes if everybody agrees. I think let's go ahead with uh, yours, maybe Chris. Is your uh, was plastic deformation in the webbing? This this you want to? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sort of. Curious how your like testing setup. Did you have to slowly keep lengthening the the setup as you tested, or you know um, account for the for the webbing? Did did that even occur? Did it plastically deform? I'm, I'm not sure how you. Yeah. The, the webbing, you think, or or something in the system? Yeah, like I'm surprised you didn't just uh, say like connect some sort of um, you know, as opposed to using polymers to test it you know why not uh, i guess use like stainless steel cable you know or something like that uh something that just wouldn't have any wouldn't have that that extra variable um yes but um that's that's a good question because uh, if i take something something on steel like the the the, the way the force come into the web block would would not be realistic and so the behavior of where the force went through the web work would be different and so we had like a break somewhere in the web block which is not realistic so the test up has to be as realistic as possible which means the realistic thing is you have like uh, how you put the webbing in the web block and you have a loose tail but the isa made some um, some tests of how the difference of the breaking strength of a web block is with uh, several different setups. So they found out that if you make take both strengths of the webbing, uh, the two strengths, and put it and and uh, make ten, put it under tension, tension, you don't have such a big difference from the realistic um, tensioning of the webbing uh, web block. And, but it's good for the test up to don't have the slippage of the webbing that we have under, under the cyclic loads. So we took both strengths and put it through the setup. So we have like how it is in, in, in real life 
the how the tension comes to the web block. So we have the real results. That was the yeah, definitely. I mean, that, that's definitely the optimal. That sounds a lot better. Um, yes. I, I guess my my question is: the the device you used to test it did that automatically like calculate when it had pulled to a force of eight kn, and then it would slack off to two, or was it just pulling a set distance every time, and you calculated that distance to be eight kn? Okay, yes, and um, at this machine or at the most machines, you can make both. But uh, what we did is the the machine measured the force every time. And so we said, okay, go from seven, uh, from two to seven kilonewton each time. And we had to, to write a program with uh, which the curve has to be. So we saw that it's like a sinus curve. And we saw, okay, we saw, say the program, uh, the machine make a sinus curve. And this was also the, the reason why we couldn't do more than one to eight kilonewton because the actual actual um, force in the machine wasn't uh, similar to a sinus curve. So he he the machine just shut down. So yes, that's ah, no, it's okay. No, yeah, that that answers my question for sure. It's um, okay. yeah, it's great. You've got access to something like that. That's incredible. Yes. Okay, um, which question we can answer now? I'm not sure if it's really possible to address it. No, nice. Is there a question? Um, ah. Yes, ask Johan. Um, typical jury question for your bachelor thesis. Um, maybe it's also a last question. I don't know if somebody else wants to do, but it's um, what should be the biggest takeaway from your um, investigation and how do you see the future of this? Well, what should be done in the future with this? Like what's, what's the next step or what's the, yeah, what's the biggest takeaway, yeah? Um, find some testing laboratories uh, which don't want any money and test as much as you can. <laughs> so this is like in general the thing. Uh, what I can say is it's very complicated to make like analysis on this. Maybe someday some we are at this point that we can say, okay, we have this much of experience. We can say, okay, we know what would happen, but cyclic loads is like, a very big um, thing everywhere in, in, in engineering. It's like <laughs> you can do, be professional and don't know what to, it really happens. So best thing we can do is to really make um, tests. Yes, as much as we can and to, to have like experience sometime somewhere in the future. Yes, I think that's the most important. Yeah, thank you. So, I think one last thank you all for listening. Yes, yes. One last yes. question from Red Slacklines. Uh, the question of what 100,000 cycles equals to. I think we may okay, um, about this. Um, yes, uh, what is it equal to? 100,000 cycles. Imagine you have much time for slacklining. You can go every third day slacklining. You, uh, you have like 100 days in the, per year, you go slacklining. So you have like each day you have to do 1,000 cycles to to come up to this 100,000 cycles in one year, just one year using the web block. But OK, 1,000 cycles. On the leash fall, we, it was measured like you have like six cycles on the web block, which, which came from the webbing into the web block. So it, each leash fall, you have six cycles. So, uh, yes, you can imagine how many leash falls you have to do per day. And you also do bounces. You also do, like, if you are trick highlining, you make jumps. So it's possibly, if you are really an intensive, uh, you go much slacklining, you have long sessions, it's possible to come up to 100,000 cycles in one year. Of course, not each cycle is from 2 to 7 kilonewtons, but that's these are the ex extreme um, measure uh, the extreme forces that could um, appear in a slack line it's it's a good question it's not we ca can't say it's like this or it's like that but we have to test what can happen because we don't want to test what it's most um, 
what's most common to happen because we don't want that 50% are not insured. We want to have no zero person insured. So that's why we have to, we want to test like this. Yes. Okay, thanks a lot, Jan. Uh, I think we'll move on to our next talk. We're already 15 minutes behind schedule, but no problem. We had lots of interesting questions and answers. He's here. Yeah. yeah. All righty. So um, the next presentation. No. Okay, give me one minute. Thank you.